like all of our speakers, Dr. Lim has an impressive background. He's a board certified physician. He got his undergraduate degree from Stanford. It was a BA in human biology and he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He went to medical school at Boston University School of Medicine. He did his residency at Santa Rosa Family Medicine Residency. And amazingly, he got his law degree from none other than Harvard Law School. I mean, I'm sure everybody's doctor has a law degree. And he married his college sweetheart, and together they have a son and daughter, and I got a kick out of how, th how this was phrased on the net, who bring them endless joy and laughter, and that's exactly what it should be, and that's what all of our grandkids bring us, I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Lim's outside interests include hiking, biking, playing tennis, cooking healthy meals, learning the guitar, and growing in his Christian faith. Obviously, he sounds to me like a potential candidate to live in Sun City Hilton Head. Um, I was blown away by the substance of the video presentation I just by chance happened to find on YouTube, and it was called An Introduction to a Whole Food Plant-Based Diet by a physician named Dr. Anthony Lim. And after watching it, I felt I was looking at the best explanation of what and why we eat the way we do that I have ever come across. And then after hearing his presentation, as many of you know, Marilyn and I were at True North last summer. And I became, um, after, let me, let me put it this way, your typical day included two lectures, one at 10 a.m. and one at two. At 10 a.m., I got to hear this person whose video I had seen, Dr. Anthony Lim, give amazing lectures to a group of people that were enraptured by everything that he was talking about. And thanks to the unbelievable life we're all leading, we're all leading due to COVID, he, like all of his counterparts, has pretty much been sequestered as we have been, as all of us have been. And when I saw him at True North, I made up my mind if there was any way we possibly could, I was going to invite him down to come and speak. And then, of course, because of COVID, the only thing good that has come out of all of that is we've got to touch base with a number of these phenomenal leaders in the whole food plant-based community, like Dr. Lim, who immediately agreed to speak as soon as I contacted him. So with no further delay, let me introduce to you, Dr. Anthony Lim. All right, Ross, thank you so much. And Sun City Eat Smart Live Longer board and club, thank you so much for this, this invitation. It's a real, it's a privilege and honor to be able to address your, your club. I've been looking forward to this for a while, even on the phone with Ross as recent as one hour ago. Uh, planning uh, for, for this event. As uh, Ross shared, I, I do work at True North where I primarily uh, lecture these days. I also serve as the medical director of a program called the McDougall program. And in the past, <laughs> pre-COVID, we ran 10 day residential programs. People came from all around the, the world um, to the Flamingo Conference Resort and spa here in Santa Rosa, where I live, uh, for 10 days of healthy plant-based eating, lectures, and uh, medical care. Uh, we have pivoted and adapted in these COVID times to online. And so for the first time ever, uh, let's see, in two days, starting Friday, we are running our very first online McDougal program. And it's, it went great, it's, uh, it's sold out within one to two weeks. Um, I've now talked with patients from Hamburg, Germany, uh, Belfast, Ireland, uh, Guam, and all around the U.S. and it's and Canada as well. Uh, and uh, we will it will be a 12-day online program, and we are planning on running those on a monthly basis. So that that is keeping me very busy. And then I also work uh, at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Rosa. Kaiser is the largest managed care organization 
in the United States. And there I primarily help out with their plant-based and lifestyle initiatives. So I have just completed a one-year pilot program uh, working with diabetic patients and really just got outstanding results uh, uh, through helping this group of, of patients transition to a, a plant-based diet. And then in my outside time, I uh, happily married to my wife, Jean, who is a, a dermatologist at Kaiser. And as Ross mentioned, I have two children, Joshua, who is 12, and, and Julia, who is eight, um, and uh, Balto, our, our dog. So it keeps, it keeps life very full and busy. Today, I'm going to talk to you about um, weight, losing weight, keeping it off. And I hope to broaden it to all, every one of you, wherever, whatever stage you're at. So for people who have never heard of plant-based eating and are just here out on an invitation from, from a friend, or for those of you who have been eating plant-based for decades, um, I hope to have material here that is, that is applicable and relevant uh, to each of you. And the way I hope to do that is to broaden out from weight loss to a, a much bigger picture. And, and you'll, you'll see how I do that. Um, I like to keep things very simple. And so what I was on the phone with Ross one hour ago was to ask how he would feel about no PowerPoint. Uh, it's the first time I've really done this uh, through a Zoom uh, format, but I feel like many of us are tech inundated these days, right? Because our main interaction is through uh, Zoom and social media and uh, how can we make this more personal? And I thought, well, let's just, let's distill it down to the basics and just do this without PowerPoint, more of a conversation. And to that end, I would encourage you if you're comfortable, this is how I've been doing my lectures at True North and uh, Kaiser uh, and through um, McDougall as well. To the extent you're comfortable, please um, turn your video on. If, you know, if uh, you're indisposed or you're on the run and it would be more distracting, that's fine. Um, but I think the more that we can uh, make this feel like a, you know, a group conversation, uh, the better. So right now I have my camera view on gallery mode um, so that I can basically uh, see all of you. Um, and that way, if I'm saying something you totally don't agree with and you're like grimacing, then I can, I can react to that. Uh, or if I'm getting lots of like, oh, nods, I get, then I, then I get, I, I feed off of that. So, um, so that's my, that's my, my request. Okay. I want to start off first with this claim which is that I've been medical director. Oh, thank you. All of you are turning your cameras on. This is great. Lovely. Um, I have been medical director of the McDougall program now for, for five years. And in my, in my experience, I have yet to see a single patient who um, complies with all three of the major principles I'm going to talk about who continues to struggle with weight. In other words, if anyone is, there's a check mark by all three of these principles I'm, I'm going to share with you, um, weight is essentially a non-issue, okay? Um, and so what are these three principles for losing weight and maintaining a healthy weight going forward into the future? Well, number one, you have to know what to eat. Okay, that, we've got to get the food content right. We have to know what to put into our mouths. So you've got to know what to eat. Number two, you need to optimize your food environment, right? And we will talk about what exactly constitutes our food environment. And then last, number three, we need to have a healthy relationship with food. And that's it. If you know what to eat, you've optimized your environment, and you have a healthy relationship with food, I think the rest will become very easy. So let's expand on each one of those, okay? So starting off first, what to eat. This is the subject of endless debate, right? You, you hear ketogenic, fruitivore, paleo, South Beach, Atkins, 
whole food plant-based, um, you know, you, you name it, you hear it. It's, there's so many various uh, theories and claims. And even within the plant-based movement, there's divergences of opinion. And we've all experienced that, which can be very confusing. And I have yet to hear a better summary of a whole food plant-based diet than these seven simple words. And I'm not a believer, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. So if someone nails it, then rather than create my own version, I am just going to take that and spread it far and wide. And so these seven words were from Michael Pollan, who is a very well-known food author and journalist. Uh, he wrote, Omnivore's Dilemma, which was a bestseller. He wrote In Defense of Food and Eater's Manifesto. And he said that what you should eat is following. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think that is the best summary in my opinion, of a whole food plant-based diet. So let's break each of those components down. First, eat food. So by eat food, what he's talking about is eat food that is min as unprocessed as possible, right? Uh, food that your great-great-grandmother would recognize, food that grows on a plant, not food that's made in a plant. Um, you know, I brought one of the nice things that's come out of, of COVID, uh, is that I started gardening. And so I brought an example of food from my garden, right? This, 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 this is food fresh off the vine, right? There's, it's completely unprocessed and it's plant-based. And this is a perfect example. In fact, uh, if I'm kind of in my show off mode, which I, which I am uh, like this, this, so I've got uh, a kabocha squash, uh, cucumber, English cucumber, I believe, uh, various types of heirloom tomatoes, uh, lemon cucumber here. It is all from, from uh, my garden. And this is my first year gardening, so it's very exciting. Um, that's food. It's all unprocessed. I haven't done anything to it. And oftentimes, I will literally take a tomato or a cucumber and just eat it raw. All right. Uh, what's, in the, what's the opposite? What's not food? Well, this. This is not food. Here we've got marshmallows, all right? This is the antithesis of food. Um, uh, you know, just to read you the ingredients, corn syrup is the number one ingredient. So corn syrup, sugar, dextrose, modified cornstarch, water, uh, tetrasodium pyrophosphate, right? When it, you have difficulty pronouncing the ingredient or when there's a long list of ingredients or when corn syrup is the number one ingredient, then you're, you're, you're definitely headed into the non-food land. Now notice this is not animal food, right? Um, I would believe this would be, be, oh, actually it's got, well, less than 2% of gelatin. But if you took that out, essentially this would be a vegan-based food, right? Um, but you can see then how even eating vegan foods, you can, if they're heavily processed, is not going to uh, be healthy for your body. All right, I think you get an idea of, eat, of, of food. Not too much, and that's just saying not in excess. Uh, one of my favorite books is called The Blue Zones, written by Dan Buettner. And the Blue Zones are areas around the world that live well past the age, uh, that have a high percentage of their popula population living well past the age of 100. So Dan Buettner identified five Blue Zones. Uh, Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, the Nicoya Peninsula, in Costa Rica, Icaria, Greece, and Loma Linda, California, that has a, a high number of Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, he interviewed over, I believe, 260 centenarians from these five different zones and distilled what they shared in common down to nine power principles. And one of those principles was what's called harahachibu uh, in, in Japanese, which basically means eat until you are 80% full. And that may not sound like rocket science, but we do not do that here in the United States. We oftentimes, our set point is eating until we are 
stuffed, you know, until we're unbuckling our belt. And I see lots of nods, so I know I'm onto something here, right? And, and how do you eat until you're 80% full? Well, think about what it means to eat till you're satiated versus what it means to eat until you're stuffed, right? When you are satiated, you could eat more, you actually have room to eat more, but you are, you are no longer hungry. So that's that, that's that difference between satiation and eating until you're stuck. And it's subtle, but if you really start to develop your mind-body awareness and start to actually listen to your body versus just sort of eating in a rushed manner and not paying any attention to the cues that your body is giving you, then you will start to appreciate the difference. Um, the last one is mostly plants. And I think this is important because many of my patients want to switch to a plant-based diet, but the idea of going 100% is overwhelming for them. You know, maybe they've grown up with certain foods that they've eaten since young for celebratory occasions or otherwise that are meaningful or significant to them. And the idea of just wholesale giving them up um, is um, enough to make them not even want to try it in the first place. And so what I like about Mostly Plants is that it allows people to come in at whatever stage of readiness they are and, and simply encourage them to move the needle. And if you think about the wording, it's called a whole food plant-based diet. For those who go 100%, they're on a whole food plant exclusive diet, which is, which is outstanding but I don't want uh, perfection to let perfection be the enemy of good. And I do think it's interesting to note that in the blue zones, not one of these populations in the blue zones was vegan, right? They all ate animal products. It's just that animal products constituted less than 10% of their total caloric intake. So it was basically the condiment to the extent that they were eating it. And even, even when they were eating it, they weren't eating Kentucky fried chicken or McDonald's chicken nuggets, right? Which is no longer food that's heavily processed, not to mention 99% likelihood of factory farmed. They were eating generally, um, you know, uh, meat or fish in its natural form uh, in a much more humanely, organically raised uh, environment. So eat food, not too much, mostly plants. If you remember nothing else than that for the rest of your life in terms of when you're on an airplane, when you're in a hotel, when you're at home, when you're in a restaurant, what do I order? If you conjure up those seven words, you really can't go too far off track, right? You're going to be for the most part right, right on track, all right? Um, oh, my wife is, hold on one second. Yeah. We have to pick up, uh, here you go, sweetie. We have, to, we have to pick up textbooks for my son and I need to give my wife a card. So, excuse me. <laughs> um, you cannot go too far off track, all right, uh, if, if you remember those seven words. Calorie density is the second principle. So we're gonna, in terms of what to eat. And calorie density is one of the most simple but powerful concepts I have come across in terms of the whole food plant-based eating. You know, I mean, you can spend forever reading the papers on, on the food properties of this vegetable versus this fruit and kind of get lost in the weeds. But if you really want, I'm, I'm all about big picture. That's just how I roll. So I want the big picture principles. And, um, and then from there, something that particularly interests me, then I might get you know, get delve into the weeds. Calorie density is one of those big picture principles that you need to just know inside and out. Now, I don't have time to fully get into it because calorie density is a lecture that I commonly give that is a lecture in and of itself. So I'm going to give you the high level overview of it and then hopefully titillate your curiosity to go online and type in Jeff Novick, N-O-V-I-C-K, calorie density, and you will see a YouTube lecture that you can watch. Jeff is a, 
a good friend of mine. We both, uh, he is a, uh, he works at the McDougal program, uh, giving many of out outstanding talks. Um, and uh, he was the one who first introduced me to the concept of calorie density when I came onto the McDougal program, uh, and I've latched onto it ever since. And calorie density is nothing more than calories in a given weight of food. So generally we use calories per pound. You could do calories per grams, but it's hard to picture 30 grams of broccoli, right? It's much easier to picture a pound of apples or a pound of broccoli. That's it, calories per pound. And so if you look at the various food groups, you start to see their average calorie density. Again, in the name of big picture and not getting lost in the weeds, I don't want people to memorize the exact calorie density of squash versus zucchini. I mean, I cannot tell you the exact calorie density of this tomato versus uh, this cucumber, but I can tell you that it's gonna approximately be 100 calories per pound because all raw vegetables are approximately 100 calories per pound. That's all I need to know. Because when you compare that with the calorie density of oil, even if it's extra virgin olive oil that you just pressed from your olive grove of trees, that's 4,000 calories per pound. So we're talking about a 40-fold difference in calorie density between oil and cucumber and tomato. And so, you know, so many people out there, they still are kind of in this Mediterranean diet mindset where they think that olive oil is something that you can just lather over your food and it's heart, heart healthy. But let me ask you a question. In a nation where 70% of the adult population is overweight or obese, and 50% either have prediabetes or diabetes, does it really make sense to be eating a lot of the most calorically dense food on planet Earth, namely oil, even if it's olive oil, right? It just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I think it's important to realize just what a differential there is. But then there's everything that falls in between it. So if we just march up briefly, we've got vegetables at 100 calories per pound. Those are the lowest calorie dense group of fruits. One step over, we've got fruits, okay? So that's around 200, 250 calories per pound. Then one step over, we have our starchy vegetables you know, corn, peas, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, or we've got our whole grains, buckwheat, barley, quinoa, oatmeal. Um, and that's all around 400, you know, anywhere from, anywhere from 300 to 500 calories per pound. And then one step over that, we have our legumes, beans, peas, lentils, 600 calories per pound. Now, isn't it fascinating to notice that the four food groups with the lowest calorie densities are the four main food groups in a whole food plant-based diet, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. And it's beautiful. And these four food groups that are the lowest in calorie density are the highest in nutrient density. They have the most fiber, and considering that we have a major fiber deficiency in our country, uh, that is a very good thing. They have the most antioxidants, uh, phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals. So uh, it's this beautiful marriage of eating low calorie dense foods with high uh, nutrient density. And the beautiful thing about eating a lot of these foods is that you don't have to count calories because these are so high in bulk and fiber and water content that your body just naturally knows when it is ha has had enough. So you reach a natural satiety set point without having to actually go through the mind-numbing, torturous exercise of counting calories. I have never once in these five years of doctoring in this whole food plant-based arena ever asked a patient to start counting their calories. And given that that's where most diets end up, is counting calories and keeping it under a certain amount, um, uh, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, not, not one of these blue zones were people counting calories. They just ate the food and their bodies naturally told them when they had had enough. Um, 
once we get past these four food groups, notice how things start to go up. So animal products, they're not the most calorie dense food, but they can be high. I mean, I generally put it at anywhere from six to 600 to 1,000 calories per pound. I mean, bacon is as high as 2,000 calories per pound, right? Um, but it's, it's definitely a step, step higher. But then what's interesting is that you have things like bread. And so I brought an example, right? Like this was bread in our, our fridge, Alvarado. Freshly sprouted wheat, whole wheat, okay? Um, and as far as bread goes, this kind of bread, uh, Dave's Killer Bread, Ezekiel Bread, those are the kind of breads I recommend for my patients. They are plant-based. But notice that this is now on the spectrum, if we go back to eat food, not too much, mostly plants, right? This is not, it's not, it's not marshmallows, right? But it's not this either. And so it's kind of in, it's kind of in between. And that's an important thing to realize is that when we talk about these things, it's not really an either or, black or white, it's really a spectrum. And so where I put bread is, it's, a, it's kind of like a minimally processed plant-based food. That's where I put tofu as well, right? In our fridge, we have blocks of tofu. That's minimally processed. I've never had to tell a patient to cut back on their tofu intake. I know it can be you know, higher in fat, but I just don't have patients with tofu addictions where it becomes an issue, you know? Um, one thing to appreciate, though, is that bread is 1,500, around 1,500 calories per pound. So let's just take a potato that's, I think, about three, 350 calories per pound. We're talking about anywhere from three to five times the calorie density of a whole starch, like potato or oatmeal, just by extracting the water, even though this has the whole grain in it, okay? And so many people are wondering why they can't lose weight. They're like, Dr. Lim, I swear I'm eating 100%, you know, whole food plant-based diet, not cheating at all. Um, and sometimes bread is the culprit, right? Because if they're eating a, a, a lot of bread, and then let's just say they're slathering it with peanut butter. I mean, one of my favorite breakfasts, I don't eat it every day, is whole wheat bread toasted with peanut butter and sliced banana. Actually, that's what I had this morning. It was delicious. But that's not a low calorie dense breakfast, right? What is a low calorie dense breakfast is what I eat the other six out of seven days a week, which is a huge bowl of steel cut oats with mashed up banana as my sweetener uh, and blueberries, frozen blueberries from Costco because they sell those big packs of organic blueberries. That's, that's my, uh, oh, and ground flaxseed to get my omega-3. Okay, that's my breakfast the vast majority of the time. Uh, sugar. So sugar, honey, maple syrup, that's all around 15, anywhere from 1,200 to 1,800 calories per pound. So those of you out there who have a sweet tooth, which is not an uncommon thing that I see in my patients, then just realize that you are eating very calorically dense foods. And then some people say, okay, I don't use sugar, but I bake a lot of things and I use dates. Well, dried fruit is around 1,500 calories per pound. So if you're inhaling lots of homemade oat bars that are filled with dates, again, you're gonna see that it, you might, you know, you may have lost a, a, a certain amount of weight initially and then plateaued. And, and so what calorie density allows you to do is it allows you to take, eat food not too much, mostly plants, and then it allows you either to kind of go down the calorie density uh, spectrum, right? Uh, if you find that you still wanna lose more weight, or as one of the questions that you all turned in, how do you gain weight? Well, you eat higher on the calorie dense spectrum. So if we take nuts and seeds, for example, nuts and seeds are about anywhere from 2,800 to 3,200 calories per pound. 2,800 to 3,200, that is a very calorically dense food. And they're easy to eat a lot of, why? Because they're salted, roasted, shelled in big containers. Right? They're easily accessible. And because of the positive press that nuts get, I know that many of my patients are shoveling them in as their snack, along with dried fruit, because that's just the fruit that's been dried, which I just told you is 1,500 calories per pound. And you can imagine that if that's their go-to snack food throughout the day, you know, 
they may they may have hit a plateau and be and be having difficulty. But on the on the other hand, if you're trying to gain weight, let's say you're underweight, right? Then I, I've told my patients to you know go ahead and make smoothies with fruits and nuts and blend it all up and drink it, and you know pretty soon you're going to start to see the weight come back on. Avocado, you know that's another. Uh, it's not super. Uh, it's around 850 calories per pound, but it's easy to eat a lot of. I've started making homemade guacamole and I can just, yeah, I can just power through that. Um, so that's where you want to be careful with, with avocado. Um, one category I also want to point out is what I call the, um, the junk food category. So potato chips, Oreos, salty sweet, right? Um, even like cliff bars, all those things, 2000 calories per pound. So, so pretty high up there. Uh, and you really want to stay away from those because not only are they more on the processed food end, but they are incredibly calorically dense. Um, the last thing I'm going to bring up for uh, what to eat is to know thyself. All right. And what that means is you need to bring in your own unique uh, health history and your own unique, you know, weaknesses, strengths, etc. So, so for example, if you are a patient who has suffered three heart attacks and had bypass surgery and multiple stents, I might strongly encourage you to consider a whole food plant exclusive way of eating, right? A la like Dr. Esselstyn, um, because the stakes are higher you have a little, you have less wiggle room. Um, and the evidence we've shown for prevention of, or for sort of reversal of heart disease has required that higher level. Um, or if you are someone with an autoimmune condition where you have a high degree of sensitivity to certain foods, then it becomes more incumbent on you to absolutely avoid those foods, right? So. I like to give a general foundation, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Keep in mind principles of calorie density to kind of fine tune one way or the other, and then know your own unique health history um, to sort of tweak it. And, then, and there you go. That's, that's where you're gonna know, and that's how you're going to eat. Okay, uh, that's what I wanna say about um, what to eat. Uh, the last thing I wanna say is that with this simple framework, I really hope that you avoid the trap of unhealthy obsession, unhealthy obsession about healthy eating. Um, I, I have many patients that basically will watch eight hours of YouTube on plant-based experts. And, you know, although I'm flattered when they say that they, you know, they've watched everything of mine and everything of everyone else's, um, you know, at a certain point, you've learned what you need to know. And, and so, you know, it's good to expand uh, your, your interests uh, into, into, other, into other areas. So just kind of watch, watch for that. If you're kind of really just obsessing about what to eat and, and, and this over that, then maybe just take a step back, see the big picture, uh, keep the basic principles in mind, and, and move on. I, I do think that in general in the U.S., whether it's paleo, ketogenic, or plant-based, or any of these, that we, I, I've seen many people fall into that trap of just obsessing. The truth is, I don't think that much about food these days. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward, um, and that's kind of what I, I hope for all of you. Okay, principle one, that's what to eat. Next, food environment. How do I optimize my food environment? And again, I'm going to break these down into three categories of your food environment. So first, there's your uh, physical environment. And next, there's your social environment. And then third is what I would call your internal environment. And the question to ask for each of these, again, in the name of simplicity, is what changes do I need to make to make unhealthy behavior more difficult? And what changes do I need to make in order that healthy behavior becomes easier? It's that simple. You want to make unhealthy habits much more difficult to do. 
Uh, I think I'm getting some feedback. Um, if All right, some, someone's got their uh, volume and there's some background noise, so maybe <laughs> if that person could just mute. So uh, We're not mute. let's just take physical environment, for example, okay? Well, um, uh, I said, Pam had said something like that to me, but I said to Debbie, I said, this lecture started at seven and I sent her a picture of my, um, let's see, a glass of wine. And so this is plant-based. This is a good um, start to the evening, like, Oh my God. So anyway, and she told me about all the excitement. She <coughs> water aerobics this morning. And JJ, you may need to mute she people. Said, Big doings. And I'm like, oh God, oh God. But that's just a youth. Liz, you'd be out of business if you didn't have, uh, you know, the stupidness of youth in some cases, I'd say. <laughs> okay. True, true story. <laughs> But still, I don't like to hear anyone getting a call at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, thanks. I think that took care of it. Good. Um, okay, so physical environment. Back. Back to back to where we were. How do we make unhealthy behavior uh, harder? Well. All right, how do we make unhealthy behavior more difficult in our physical environment? Well, now, now that you know what to eat, right? You basically just go around your house and you do a survey of in, in inventory and you look, all right, what's not food? All right, this is not food, you know, all right, garbage, right? Uh, food, eat it, right? So the, 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 the food, offending foods you just want out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. You just do, do not like test your willpower on a daily basis by having to pass by these tantalizing foods that are just saying, eat me, come on, eat me, right? Just, you know, get it out. Um, and I, 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 when I was at working at a certain branch of Kaiser, it was interesting, every Friday, in the break room would be a large pink box. And we all know what was in that pink box, right? It was filled with donuts. What was fascinating is that, you know, around noon, they were still mostly full, okay? But come 5 p.m., empty, completely empty. And I couldn't help but think like that, however many thousands of calories, was likely eaten just because it, that pink box was there, right? And I don't think that everyone who ate a donut would have gone to the trouble to get in their car during their lunch break, drive to the donut store, buy a donut, bring it back, and then eat it as their mid-afternoon snack. But after six hours of seeing patients, it's almost the weekend, and you're just like running on fumes. <gasps> You know, chocolate glazed donut, come on, right? Like, <laughs> you know, so that's how do we make unhealthy behavior harder? Well, get that pink box out of there, right? Now on the flip side though, let's pretend you're coming from the standard American diet, which is 60% processed food, 30% animal based, and then really less than 10% that belong to those four groups, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. If you remove all the offending foods out of your house, you might be left with a, a rotting banana in your fridge and that's it. So you haven't done much to make healthy behavior easier or simpler. And so what's the flip side now? Now you've got to go to, the, to Costco or to your local grocery store and just buy, you know, fill up, you know, buy your brown rice, buy your uh, steel cut oats, buy your canned beans, buy your bag beans to make in your instant pot, you know, uh, fill up your produce with fruits, vegetables, um, you plan out your weekly meal so that you, you've got everything uh, all prepared. And there, now your physical environment is making healthy behavior, in this case, healthy eating, much easier. My kids 
virtually never take grapes out of the grocery bag, wash them, and eat them. They just don't. But if I wash those grapes, put them in the nice bowl at eye level, they're gone by the end of the day. They're gone. Done. But what did I do? I just made healthy behavior easier. It really is that simple. You know, we, are, we can be pretty like lazy, weak creatures, right? So knowing that about ourselves and accepting that about ourselves, let's make things easier for us. And let's make it harder for us, more difficult to engage in the kind of eating behavior that we know is not good for us in the long term. Well, how do we apply that same kind of framework to social environment? Pause and think about those people in your life where when you're around them, you tend to eat unhealthy. <laughs> it's really that simple, right? And let's pretend I remember, I, I remember once I had a patient where she said that every week she got together with her girls and they went to this place and they would get drinks and they weren't eating carrots and hummus, right? They were eating all those kind of like buffalo chicken wings and, you know, salted nuts and all those kind of snack appetizer foods, get the ranch dip sauce and, and all that. I'm sorry, but as long as she continues to hang out with that group of friends in that manner, it is going to be a very difficult exercise for her to really adopt a whole food plant-based way of eating. So what do you, so what do, you do with those individuals in your life um, where that, make, that cause you to generally eat less healthy? Well, there's a couple of options. Um, one is that you... Um, find places to eat that you can find healthy choices um, and just That's tell them. Dr. Anthony Lim. He's one of the doctors at True North. Okay, thanks. Um, one is that you, you just have an honest conversation with them and, and tell them what you're trying to do. And so if we could change the venue that we hang out. Um, one is uh, another option is if they really, if they just are not willing to do that, you can try and find other ways of spending time with them that don't involve food. So, if, you know, I'm not saying discard the friendship, but if it really is a true friendship, if this friendship is really based on something real, then it's got to be stronger than, than food, right? So go for a hike, you know, go for a walk. Um, you know, do something, go, go watch Hamilton. I just saw Hamilton. That, wow, that is a good musical. So go watch Hamilton. I mean, you, you get the idea. Do something that's non-food related. And you just tell them, like, look, friend, I value our friendship. We've been friends a long time. But I got to be honest, I'm trying to make some healthy changes. And us hanging out in the way we've been is making it very difficult for me. I'm just not strong enough yet. So can we hang out, but in a different way, right? If all that fails, sometimes you just need to spend less time with those friends. But you have to be proactive about managing that aspect. And then on the flip side, think about those friends where they're already eating healthy. And so it almost kind of like it's, it's pulling you up and encouraging you. And then find, find ways of how you can spend more time with them. But just think really carefully about your social influences, because uh, that is your environment. Your environment is your physical environment, and it is your social environment. Now, you all have a huge advantage. I mean, Ross was telling me about your community, and I'm going to be honest, I have never heard of anything like it. It is awesome. I am 43 years old. I've got 12 years left. So... I mean, I'm going to be joining you soon, all right? My daughter, she's eight now. Uh, she'll be 20 by then, so I think I, I qualify, you know? You, have the, you all have this huge advantage because you've got 700 fellow souls who are all trying to do this and talk about strength in numbers. It's awesome. I mean, I'm, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be boasting about you all you know, it's sort of setting the benchmark for what it means to embark on this journey 
together in community. You, you all get it. You all get the power of community. That it's, so, it's, it's more than just food, right? It's relationship. And so I just want to call out that in my five years of uh, being plant-based, I have never really heard of anything quite like what you've built. It's very special. And, and as I told Ross, I hope that your 700 uh, in short time grows to the 16,000 that are, that he told me are part of the Sun City community. Why not, right? I, I, I think every single person there, if they know what's good for them, let's turn Sun City into a blue zone. Wouldn't that be awesome? Man, I'm getting excited just talking about it. To start a movement. But you have to let me in when I turn 55. That's the, that's the condition. Um, okay, the last is uh, internal environment. And this is the one that's oftentimes neglected. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really get talked about. But it's critically important, is, which is basically how are you doing on the inside? Because how you're doing on the inside is going to profoundly impact your ability to make healthy food choices. Let's take an example. If you are sleep deprived, working 14 hour days, highly stressed out and sedentary, do you think you're in the best place to be making healthy decisions about what you put into your mouth? Or do you think you're kind of in survival mode, just sort of putting in whatever's there, right? I mean, we all know when, whenever I talk to a patient and they talk about how they've kind of gone off track, it's always these other factors that are playing in that are making their lives kind of topsy-turvy. And so we need to actually pay attention to all the factors that go into our internal sense of well-being. Because the better your sense of well-being, the better your position to make healthy choices, even if they are difficult. You're going to have more reserves. One of my favorite children's book is called How Full Is Your Bucket? You know, it's this idea of this little kid going around and he gets teased and this and that and his bucket's empty. And so he doesn't really have anything in his reserves to be nice to other people. Uh, but really, the kind of message is the problem is not, is not him. It's the problem is that his bucket is empty. And so I don't remember exactly the story, but basically as his bucket fills up through um, people doing nice things and him receiving a lot of love, well, guess what? He has a lot of love to give. His bucket is full, okay? So it, it, the easy way of thinking about your internal environment, if you just ask yourself this, is just say, is my bucket full or is it empty? All right, and if it's empty or it's running on low, you know, the, the, the gas light has come on, <laughs> the fuel indicator light has come on, come on, then you're running on fumes and you need to take care of yourself. And what are the factors that go into taking care of yourself? Sleep, right? Adequate sleep. Um, community, right? Feeling known and loved for, for who you are. A relationship. How you manage stress. You know, what are your stress levels? Your work-life balance. Uh, for some people, faith, spirituality, um, movement, right? Are you getting daily movement? Are you moving your body? <clears throat> All those are factors that go into your internal sense of well-being. And so, again, it's the same question. You know, what changes in my internal environment do I need to make in order to make the healthy behaviors easier and the unhealthy behaviors more difficult? Okay. So now we've hit two, two out of three. Hit what to eat, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Keep in mind principles of calorie density and know, know yourself and your own medical background. And if you need to go stricter, then accept that because your health history has dictated that. Uh, optimize your food environment. And what does that entail? Your physical environment, your social environment, and your internal environment. Make unhealthy behavior more difficult. Make healthy behavior easier. And then the last one, and I would say the one that I'm most interested in these days is your relationship with food. 
Uh, and this one really does not get much attention. You know, I, I, there's, a, there's this kind of idea, right? Like it's the food. When we're talking about all this disease, all this chronic disease, all this obesity, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, it's the food. And when I first entered the plant-based movement, I, I really mu very much believed that, that as long as we get the food right, then everything else kind of takes care of itself. I think now I have a little bit more nuanced view of it, that food is absolutely essential and we do need to get it right. But what I'm finding and discovering in the lives of my patients is that it's actually not the food. It's that food is the symptom. That food is the thing that many people are turning to as a escape, as a numbing agent for unrest, unease, uh, strong emotion, things in their lives that are very difficult to cope with. And I can say that with every single patient I have encountered that has struggled with a whole food plant-based diet after they've gotten the necessary foundation in, you know, in, the, in the basics of it, not one of them, not one has struggled because they did not know what to eat. It wasn't like they like, oh, I guess I got that wrong. You mean I'm not supposed to be having Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, marshmallows, you know, and a bowl full of like salted roasted nuts every day? Like, oh, okay, more, more cucumber, more tomatoes. I, can, I got it. I'm set now, right? It's never that. It's that they know what to eat, but geez, life sure makes it difficult to eat what they know to eat. And so we need to start paying attention to what it is in our lives that are driving us to eat foods that we know not to be in our best interest in the long term. There's a, right now during this COVID period, they call it the COVID-15, right? Basically, many people, the, you know, the freshman 15, where you gain 15 pounds during freshman, they're calling it the COVID-15 because people all over the world are gaining weight. You know, what, well, isn't it interesting? Not only are they gaining weight, but during this COVID period, uh, strife within the home is much higher. There's lots more instances of domestic abuse. Gambling, online gambling is higher. Online pornography is at an all-time high. Alcohol consumption within the home is increasing. Is the problem the alcohol? Is the problem the food? Is the problem the pornography? Is the problem the, uh, the gambling? Well, those are symptoms, those are manifestations, but the problem is the, you know, sense of like helplessness, hopelessness, fear, anxiety, and inadequate tools to cope with those very difficult feelings and emotions that people are grappling with during this mm -hmm. very uncertain and, 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 and scary and period. So. And so I think that what people need to start doing is, is, is actually going upstream from food. You know, I used to think food was the epicenter and we just get the food right. But what I'm really appreciating is that if we think of food for, for many as kind of the drug that they are turning to in order to ease uh, this distress, then we have to go in up, upstream from that and look at the distress. And we need to think of healthy ways of managing that distress, that sadness, that anger, that anxiety, that uncertainty that does not involve food, that does not involve alcohol, that does not involve taking it out on your loved ones, 
that does not involve spending your life savings on, on gambling for the little thrill of, or excitement, right? <clears throat> and so what I, my, my kind of developing hypothesis is that, wow, like food actually represents an opportunity to learn more about yourself, to learn what the real issue is. It's kind of scary to go there, right? There's, it's the, you know, Carl Jung, very well-known psychiatrist, he talks about what's called the shadow. And the shadow is that part of ourselves that we do not like. And every person deals with their shadow side differently. Many people bury it, deny it, do not acknowledge that it exists. They are unable to see anything about themselves that is not ideal. They can't, it's too painful. And so as a result, they just ignore it, deny it, try to escape from it. But I will tell you that the people who, who really begin to experience the most peace, begin to really grow in their relationship, not just with food, but with life, with other people, are those people who start to see their weaknesses, accept them, and love themselves in spite of it. <laughs> you know, and, and in seeing their own weaknesses, they actually become less judgmental of other people because they realize they're not all that great either. You know, and, and, and then it kind of reaches this point like, we're all in this big mess together. No one's really got the market cornered on, you know, perfection. So how can I judge you when I'm a basket case myself? <laughs> you know, and that's the beginning of real connection. Because I bet each of you can say that the one thing that drives you more crazy than anything else in this world, I'm just going to guess, is when you feel judged by someone else as less than, not good enough. And so you want to watch that behavior in yourself. You know, have you ever found yourself judging a person because of what they ate? I'm sure that some of us have. I know I've done it, right? And I've had to watch that. I've had to be able to say to myself, that food on that person's plate is not healthy. That doesn't say anything about who that person is. It just says that they're eating an unhealthy meal. <laughs> That's it. Am I going to let what they eat stand in the way of our relationship, as so many people in the plant-based movement do? I mean, have you seen plant-based experts fighting with each other? Like, it's ridiculous. Even within our own cherished whole food plant-based movement, we are fighting with each other. And I'm sort of in disbelief. It's basically saying we're going to let our view on nuts or oil or whatever it may be, we're going to let that kind of stand as, you know, a, an obstacle to our friendship versus saying like, hey, you know, this doctor has this opinion. This is my opinion. I have deep respect for this, this individual. Here's the basis for uh, my position. Ultimately, you, the consumer, the patient, the participant is going to need to make up your own mind. <laughs> and I think that's what people need to see more of. The last thing I want to see, the thing that breaks my heart is when I see two heroes of mine, like fighting. I don't mind healthy debates. You know, I just watched the DNC uh, yesterday and, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into politics, but I'm just going to say I was inspired to hear the little snippet on John McCain and Joe Biden. <clears throat> Basically, you know, they disagreed fundamentally about very important policies on the Senate floor. And then that same day, they would be having dinner together and sharing drinks. That's what we need more of. We need to be able to disagree with each other and still love each other. And, and you do not see that. You don't see it in politics. You don't see it in, in the work environment. And, and you don't see it in the plant-based movement. You know, if I mention the words ketogenic and paleo, I see most plant-based people, it's like, you know, it's like 
but they want to have nothing to do with that person. And I'm like, come on. Like, it's just what they eat. It's not who they are as a person. So let's, you know, let's start to build bridges as opposed to walls based on what we're eating. All right, as, as you can tell, I feel pretty passionate about this, right? <laughs> so, so that's our relationship. Uh, and, and that is really the, the area that I am the most fascinated by these days. Because so many of my patients coming to a program are hyper-focused on the food. They think it's all about the food. And if they just get the food right, everything else will take care of itself. And even if it's their fifth, sixth go around on some plant-based program, they still think it's the food. And then I ask them the simple question, did you not know what to do the second time around? Did you not know what, like, or was it that something in you, is going on in your life that's making it difficult? And no one has ever said, oh, I just didn't know. When really you dig down, it is always because of something. It's because they have a toxic relationship with their spouse. It's because they are now in the position of taking care of their parents and they are having caregiver burnout. It's because they've been traumatized as a child. I know that there are those who disagree that any sort of eating can stem from your trauma as a child. I completely disagree. I have seen it. I have witnessed it. I have seen how the patterns and the ways that you view yourself as a child go on to affect you 10, 20, 40, 50, 80 years later. Because if you never addressed it as a young person, it doesn't magically disappear. The fact that you were verbally abused by your father does not just go away on its own. The fact that your parents got a divorce at age 11 and then your father, le your father left and abandoned you and had no desire to see you again, that doesn't just heal and cure itself with time? And is it a huge stretch of the imagination to, to think that that sort of insult and injury as a young child could lead to low feelings of self-esteem, which could lead to reaching out for the highest source of pleasure in that moment. And instead of going to something illegal like cocaine or heroin, you turn to a donut or a Big Mac. It's not a stretch of the imagination for me. I've seen it again and again and again in the lives of my patients. And what's really concerning <clears throat> is that because we're not talking about this aspect, because we're not talking about the emotional aspect and the upstream factors that are driving them to eat these unhealthy foods, guess what? they feel like a failure because each time they do a program are told, just eat the food. It's the food. It's not that complicated. And then they get it. They, they lose some weight and then something happens. Life happens. COVID happens. Death in the family happens. Serious illness happens and they relapse guess how that person feels? They feel like an utter failure. Man, it's just the food. Why can't I get it? And I would argue that their attention is focused in the wrong place. You know, in this one year program that I've run at Kaiser, focusing on these 13 patients who have diabetes, I would say that we have spent less than 5% of our total time together. We met on a weekly basis two hours every Thursday. It's wrapping up in about, uh, we started last September, it's wrapping up this September. We spent less than 5% of the time talking about food. <laughs> because once you know to eat food, not too much, mostly plants, and then use caloric density principles to fine tune, there's not really much more to talk about. But there is a lot to talk about when it comes to the reasons why we turn to that food. And that's been the subject of a lot of conversation. And despite spending 95% of our time on those other factors and less than 5% of our time on food, 
you have we that that group of 13 patients has lost over 270 pounds over the course of this year. They've come off of countless diabetic medications. One person's hemoglobin A1C went from uh, 10 point something to the to the low sevens. I mean, just awesome results. But we didn't have to hyper focus on food. We had to. We had to deal with the upstream factors. And I made clear from day one of that program, I said, my focus, my metric of success this year is not how much weight you lose. It's not how many medications you come off of. It's not um, how, 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 how much your hemoglobin A1C dropped. My metric of success is how much closer do your daily actions on a daily basis align with your deepest held values? And that's not just in the food department. That's just all of life. How much closer are you to having your actions reflect your deepest held values? To basically becoming the self that you know you're capable of becoming. Because I just have the full confidence that as you grow more and more into your best self, that the food becomes much, much easier. You're not constantly struggling to eat the right foods because your bucket is fuller. <laughs> you're, you're coming from a place of full as, a com as opposed to coming from a place of empty. So- uh, Dr. Lamb? Will... Yes, sir. This is Ross. Uh, we're, we're running a little bit later than we wanted to run because we've got a bunch of questions that from the from Awesome. The well, I, 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 I am done. I will just, uh, in conclusion, say that's it. To wrap up, three things. I have never met a patient who has all three of these nailed down and is still struggling with obesity and weight. Know what to eat. Keep it simple. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Optimize your food environment, physical, social, internal environment and look at your relationship with food, help it to become healthy, and look at those upstream factors that are driving unhealthy behavior and attend to them. Okay. Thank you very, very much. And now we have some questions from Judy um, Cody, who were suggested, these questions were suggested by our members. Take it away, Judy. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lim, for such a wonderful presentation, especially the third part about our relationship. Let me get to the first question. Um, what would you suggest to those following plant-based eating and finding themselves losing too much weight? And we have, have you any suggestions for putting on a few more pounds? Yeah, so well, two important points. First off, I had many patients who thought they've lost too much weight who are actually just coming into their optimal weight, okay? So one of the most important numbers you can know about yourself is your body mass index, okay? And body mass index looks at your weight relative to your height. And unless you are a professional bodybuilder, which I rarely meet in the circles that I run in, then your BMI really ideally would at a minimum be within the normal weight category, which is 18.5 to 25, okay? But even within that normal weight category, studies have shown that those people who are in a BMI of anywhere from like 20 to 22 do better in terms of mortality, cardiovascular outcomes, all of that compared with people who are at the upper end of the BMI range, 24, 25. So my, take me for example, I'm five foot eight. When I step on the scale these days, I'm 142. I, I, I make sure I stay in that zone since 2015 my weight has stayed within 140 to 145. If it starts to creep up above 145 after I've gone on some trip somewhere, then I just go into lockdown mode, like super clean eating, you know, and, and it just falls back into place. So many people are at a BMI of 23 thinking they have lost too much weight. And I tell them, no, all good. Keep in mind that in a nation that is 70% overweight and obese, you're gonna look real thin with a BMI of 23. All right, so don't, don't look at yourself relative to other people. Know what is healthy and, and go there. But 
let's say that you're kind of, for some reason at BMI of like 18, you're actually underweight, which again, I rarely meet these people, but let's say you are, then again, the beauty of calorie density is it goes the other way. It's just so often we so rarely need to talk about it in this direction, which is eating nuts, eating seeds. Hey, you get free license on smoothies, green smoothies, even though liquid calories are easier to consume more because you need to gain weight. So just eat more, uh, more calorically dense foods, eat a lot of starches, beans, um, all of that. Thank you, doctor. Um, our next question is um, for people with GI issues who are following a uh, plant-based uh, food pattern, how long does it generally take to see improvement? Do they ever get off their medications such as a prizo or polyphylene glycol powder? So oh, for those of you who don't know, a, a prizo is a, the generic name is mesalamine, sort of an anti-inflammatory drug that's oftentimes used for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, relatively, uh, uh, not a bad medication, minimal side effects, but hey, if you don't need to be on it, you don't want to be on it, right? Uh, and then polyethylene glycol is also known as Miralax, a pretty powerful osmotic laxative that will help you poop if you're having trouble pooping, right? Um, bottom line is that GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, are one of the first to improve on a whole food plant-based diet. And it's not any wonder why, right? I mean, you're basically, your GI tract is the one uh, organ system that is directly in contact with the foods that you eat. So if you start putting healthier anti-inflammatory whole plant foods in and in addition, start removing the offending agents of huge amounts of saturated fat, oil, uh, processed foods. Oh man, your GI tract's just singing. And so we see people with GERD uh, within a day uh, just be able to come off of their uh, GERD medications. Um, constipation is one of the first things to improve. In fact, sometimes we have the opposite problems. Like, Doc, I'm going three times a day now. I'm like, beautiful. You know, I mean, this is called TMI, but I've gone three times today. All right, for what it's worth. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm perfectly happy with that. So, you know, you're, you're just, you're, your GI system singing because why? Because it's high fiber, it's high liquid because these plant-based foods are full of liquid. And as long as you're exercising, then you're move, you're kind of getting some movement. And so, you know, it's like clockwork. I think that one of the best ways to tell the health of a person is to ask about their bowel to be honest. You can tell a lot by somebody's poop. So. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Lim. Um, our next question is, um, will eliminating vegan products such as diet and non-dairy cheese and non-dairy sour cream and et cetera, help facilitate weight loss of those last eight or 10 stubborn pounds for any woman uh, doing and eating a whole food plant-based diet? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so, so now, this is, this is one of my favorite things. Here's a very specific question, right? Well, diet cheese, non-dairy cheese, and non-dairy sour cream, would it? And so let's take that specific, and let's always abstract to larger principles. So what's the larger principle here? Calorie density, right? If you actually were to calculate out the calorie density of the non-dairy cheese um, and, and, and sour cream, it is a little harder for a liquid-based thing, so sour cream's a little, but take my word for it, it's, it's gonna be hot in calorie density, right? But if you were to do the cheese, it's gonna come in at 2,000 calories per pound, probably, right? So you now no longer even need to ask that specific question because you're just gonna abstract the more general principle of calorie density. You're gonna figure out what the calorie density is, and then, and soon you won't even need to figure out what the calorie density is. You just look at a plate, I can look at a plate of food and just know generally what's going on. You know, and, and an easy rule is usually if it's processed, it's gonna be higher than calorie density. The, the main processed, you know, or bagged or canned things I buy are actually whole plant foods, frozen blueberries, like frozen fruits and vegetables, right? Uh, canned beans, like those are the kind of packaged things you want. Otherwise you wanna be on, as they say, the outside of the grocery store, right? Where all the, the fresh stuff is. If you have a food in your house that you are not worried about it rotting, yeah, get it out. And I do want to say, I say get it out, but 
yet you saw me with marshmallows, right? And I didn't just get those marshmallows for this talk. The fact is, and I know I'm, I'm, I know I'm controversial in this respect, I don't actually think there's a single evil food. I don't, I don't like this evil good distinction. I like thinking that there are some very unhealthy foods and there are some very healthy foods and everything's along a spectrum. And the key is that these very unhealthy foods, you either want to eliminate or eat very sparingly. So my parents just celebrated their golden anniversary, 50 years. And I had the, the huge honor of, of being a part of it. You know, the originally it was going to be this large event of over 200 people, but with COVID, it was the 11 of us, my parents, my brother's family, and my family. And my mom spent hours making this three-layer fruitcake with marzipan and frosting. It was absolutely gorgeous. Was it low in calorie density? Absolutely not. You know, I don't even need to calculate it to know it's probably over 1,800 calories per pound. Did I eat it? Heck yeah. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it. In fact, I brought some back here to Santa Rosa with me and I just had a piece yesterday. And as I ate it, trust me, the joy I received from reminiscing about the fact <clears throat> that my parents have been married 50 years, <laughs> that's priceless. You know, I'm not like sweating the fact that this is a high calorie dense food that has sugar and frosting on it. So, but I am not eating fruitcake breakfast, lunch, dinner every day. And I'm not craving it. If I, if I, if I, and this is the know thyself piece. If you know that you have a sugar addiction, if you know that sugar for you is what a glass of wine is for an alcoholic, that's fine. Then just own it. Then just say, I, I can't have that as much as I'd love to. I really can't have it because it's just an addiction for me. Don't be ashamed of it. You know, I kind of joke with my audiences that I'm, a, I'm addicted to Netflix drama series. And when I first watched the first episode of, I think it was called House of Cards with Kevin, uh, Kevin Spacey, yeah. I think that, right? Uh, eight hours later and eight episodes later, I realized that I had a problem, right? And that was a work day. I had to show up to see patients that day with kids. I was, I was useless. And so what have I done? I've kind of sworn off these, these Netflix drama series you know, because I, I can't do it one at a time, once a week or in some sort of, I, I'm like a, a binge, binge watcher. So I don't even open that box. I've optimized my environment by saying, no, thank you. Maybe when I retire, but not, not now. So just own it, you know, own, own that. So but bottom line is I don't like this either or bad, evil. I just think unhealthy, healthy. I need, I need to eat more of the healthy foods. You know, if I'm overweight, I need to eat more of the low calorie dense foods. And if you think about it this way, you are never, you are never on or off. You know, I, I, I get patients that kind of say, oh, I went off the diet. I'm like, what does that mean? I, I didn't know that you, yeah. yeah. Is, is, it, is there some magical threshold? Oh, you had a marshmallow. You are now off, you know, because you passed them a lot. No, I mean, come on, right? It's a spectrum. All I know is that right now, okay, this, I'm going to try and use my screen. This is 90%. This is how much of our standard American diet is basically not good for us. And so this is how much is good for us. Now, do I think that the only metric of success is that everything has to be good for us? No, that's ridiculous, right? So let's just start to increase this wedge more and more and more and more. And stop thinking like I'm on it, I'm off of it. You're just a work in progress, kind of moving your way along at different times. And always trying to do better. Thanks for that one, Dr. Lin. That was a great answer. Um, the next question is, um, do certain food combinations offer the best chance for losing weight or simply eating whole food plant-based without considerations of combining? Yeah, I'm not into the whole food combining thing. Uh, I, I don't think, the one thing I will say is I, I believe thoroughly that we have the diversity of fruits, plants, whole grains, and legumes for a reason, right? Which is that it's meant, they're meant to all be enjoyed. And so if you look at, you know, this versus this, <laughs> green, red, they're different colors. I'm gonna be getting different phytonutrients and antioxidants by eating both of these, right? And then when I, when I combine it with my kabocha squash and then my, you know, 
I mean, look at these colors, right? I, I want all of this. I don't want to just eat one of them. So uh, I, I, I don't believe in necessary food combining, but what I do believe is eating of the cornucopia, that's the word that came to mind, the cornucopia of amazing, beautiful, whole plant-based foods that we have been blessed with. And so that means eating vegetables, eating fruits, eating legumes, and eating whole grains of all different types and varieties. And when, when it comes to a plate, you know, Jeff Novick and I are fans of what we, of we call the 50-50 plate. That 50% of our plate is like vegetables of different types. And then 50% is some combination of whole grains or starchy vegetables and legumes. And that just seems to offer this nice balance with what is desserts? Ice cream? Even if it's coconut ice cream? No. Maybe for the special occasion, right? Fruit. You know, fruit, let fruit be your dessert. I've told, I've told my patients that I want their upper level of sweet threshold to be a ripe white peach at the peak of summer. Like, that is their, like, uh, you know, give it to me. And then every now and then you have your mother's golden anniversary fruit cake, you know, as a special treat. We're gonna to have to wrap it up and maybe one quick question. Um, I'm gonna combine a few together. Um, eating whole food plant-based, will it help us get rid of say restless leg syndromes or, or allergies, something like that? Yeah, I kind of group this into the, you know, these certain conditions, like you know, let's say restless leg syndromes or allergies. Um, and what I will say is that there are many conditions that, I, to my knowledge, we do not have evidence. Like we do not have a trial that looked at whole food plant based and specifically restless leg syndrome. But what I will say is that in, in and I don't speak just on my, uh, for myself, I speak on behalf of all the plant based doctors. In our collective experience, what we oftentimes see is a significant improvement in some of these chronic conditions, right? We, we have good evidence for certain ones like heart disease, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, um, obesity, right? Uh, but others, it's, it's, it's more big, uh, an experience. And so never do I see things get worse, right? Vast majority of times I see things get better. And there is always the hope and possibility that it will um, you know, uh, completely resolve. And so I'll use myself as an example. I have suffered with atopic dermatitis or eczema for my whole life. I have seen the dermatologist. I remember I, I go see Dr. Emmett, Dr. Steve Emmett growing up countless times and love the guy. But what do you think he gave me every time? Steroids, right? Steroid cream, steroid ointments. Here's the latest steroid. And, and I would just lather it on. And sure enough, it worked for as long as I was using it. And, and maybe a week after, and then boom, it came back on. Well, all I know is I don't remember the last time I used steroid cream or ointment. Plant-based has radically improved my eczema. You know, I, I, if I may say so myself, I've got kind of baby butt smooth skin here right now. And this used to be oftentimes dry, scaly, and red and inflamed. And there's no question in my mind, a large part of it was the food that I was eating. Another big part of it actually was the stress. I mean, my stress levels have gone way down since finding my passion uh, and what I feel is my calling within this sort of field that I'm in, which is basically, uh, the way I think of this field, I don't even think of it as whole food plant-based. I think of basically how to transform people's lives and make them healthier and, 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 and take that sort of macro view. Mm -hmm. And so I'll end with, with one last thing, which I, I think is very important to mention, that as you, you know, especially with that last point, like the emotional eating, the food relationship, just know that as you take away behaviors, like say you manage to willpower your way into when you feel a certain, let's say you feel angry, or let's say you feel depressed, or let's say you feel anxious, you manage to close that door to bonbons and chocolate and ice cream. You might be able to white knuckle it for so long but if you don't find a replacement behavior, a substitute that takes you in the direction that you want to go, it's going to be a short-lived victory. So it's a twofold thing. It's not only closing the door to the offending agent, 
it's opening the door to the healing agent. And so I'll use myself as an example of my last, last anecdote. I will tell you that even when I went plant-based, I still struggled with emotional eating. And guess what form it took? I mean, I wasn't overweight. I was yeah, 142 pounds, but here was my behavior. When I was working on a PowerPoint in front of this very computer that you see me talking to in, in my messy study, that's on my hit list is organization. And I would get stuck because I suffer from, at times, this perfectionist. It's never good enough, right? I suck, I, that is something I've struggled with. When I was stuck on this PowerPoint, the restless energy that would come up inside and the feelings of unease were so intense that the only thing I knew what to do was to go to the fridge and eat. And so I am not exaggerating when I say that if, if you had a video camera trained on me, during these periods, you would easily see 10, 20 visits to the fridge. Now, I wasn't eating junk. I was eating, I mean, I would actually eat things like carrots and hummus or an apple. I would generally choose healthy foods. And so my pa patients kind of gave me, you know, they kind of laughed at me. It's like, oh, come, oh my gosh, you're going to the fridge and eating carrots and hummus and apples. Oh. But that's not the point. The point was I was turning to food for a role that food was not intended to take. Yes. Dr. Lim, um, this person wanted to ask you about uh, olive oil. And it's, he said that olive oil is not a food that is eaten by itself. It's always eaten with another food. And usually that's with vegetables, like on a salad or in roasting vegetables. So if you put a tablespoon of olive oil on a pound of salad, then wouldn't that bring the calorie density of the salad with oil down to acceptable levels? Okay, that is a, is a really good question. And, and answering this question will kind of give you a sense of my style of doctoring, okay? Um, I cannot answer that question without knowing your, who you are. And here's why. Um, I'm gonna say something like sacrilegious here, but uh, I'll say it because I'm all about authenticity, here, you know? Um, it's just how I roll, right? When I eat these tomatoes, the way I've been eating them is I just slice them up, okay? And I put them on a plate, and I take out my balsamic vinegar, and I put that balsamic vinegar all around it. Mm -hmm. And I've tried it just like that, and it's good. But if I add a little bit of olive oil with that vinegar, whoa. You know, I'm just saying, I'm speaking for myself. For me, it takes this, it takes it to a new level. And my enjoyment of it is much more, and I eat it much more. Now, I am, my BMI is optimal. My total cholesterol is less than 150. My LDL is less than 80. I do not have any metabolic diabetic condition, right? And so every metric of health Check, 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 check. So I don't sweat it. I don't really think about it. I think, but I think of olive oil in its rightful place, which is as a very calorically dense food, uh, 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 not a whole plant food. And so I want to minimize my use of it, but I do use it. I don't think it's an evil food. So if that person asking this question is pretty much, you know, they're pretty healthy, doing well, and no cardiac issues, then I'll be like, hey, outstanding, you know, enjoy. If they are the person, you know, with uh, cardiac issues and a history of heart attack, then I'll just be honest with them. I'll say, you know, I don't know. Probably if that's all the oil you're getting, it's probably going to be okay. But I just want you to know there are certain plant-based experts out there who feel very strongly that that little bit of oil, is, is it could be clogging up your arteries even more. So you're going to have to make the decision uh, for yourself. And in that way, what I'm ultimately doing is I'm putting the – you know, I, I want to empower my patients. If there's one thing I want you all to take away is please do not do any sort of health behavior because Dr. So-and-so said so. Because that's only gonna last as long as Dr. So-and-so says this, right? And you're just kind of like a leaf in the wind floating this way and then that way. And what you wanna do is take these expert opinions and, and match it up with your own worldview and kind of see what fits. 
And in that way, you will start to trust yourself more. I want my patients to trust themselves more, feel more empowered, and make their own decisions. I don't want to be the one telling them what to do. I want to present them with the knowledge, present them with their options, and then let them, and then let them choose uh, on their own, um, being, you know, being willing to face whatever consequences there are. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Okay, back to you, Ross. Anthony, Dr. Lim, thank you very, very much. And earlier when you started your presentation, <clears throat> you reminded us you're 43 years old, and in 12 years, you'll be old enough to live in Sun City. We'll keep the light on for you. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone, for sharing your evening with us and with the good doctor. And thank you again so much, Dr. Lim, for sharing yours with us. Thank you. I've good evening, totally everyone. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.